See the screen with Olivia Blanchard, author of Social Media ROI and expert at extreme zombie apocalypse readiness? Oh, boy. You see that? I see it. I see it. Okay, good. All right. So with co-host Marjorie Clayman and Brian Victory, we've got a new Hecklers Hangout community that nobody knows how to operate yet, including me. Thus, we're starting out a little bit later than normal. Um, but, you know, we've got all remedial people on board now, and we are ready to go. There's my first heckle. Uh, if not actively heckling, mute mics. Unless you were singing the shower song, then you can turn it on. Uh, that only applies to one person on this call today. Uh, keep it PG-13. Use the group chat for off-topic humor. And by all means, do the hashtag Hector's Hangout like I'm sure Joseph is doing right now. Um, and uh, we will uh, respond to those tweets. So uh, meanwhile in Greenville, I figured you'd like this one, Olivier. It took me a while to find a picture, but there you go. That's, that's me on the left. <laughs> <laughs> read the book and read the book and become a stud that becomes a keynote speaker in Austin, Texas, the same week as South by Southwest. So um, that is it for that. Now you know. Come on, Margie, uh, give her, uh, give Olivier a good tribute before he uh, takes off from there. A good tribute. Well. Or, or give him a bad one. We're good at that too. A bad tribute. I can do that. Okay. So. I was shamed last time Olivier was on because I didn't know we were doing show and tell. So I have show and tell today. Um, so Olivier wrote this book. Yes. This is the second time I bought his book, by the way. It's that good. <laughs> Why? This book is bigger than you, Margie. <laughs> it's bigger than me. Yuri, I kind of hate you. But um, then I read this book because Olivier highly recommended it, and he happens to be quoted in it. It's an amazing coincidence. Oh, totally I coincidence. I had no idea. Yeah, it's weird. And let's see, what else? Olivier is writing a book, which is going to be, I guess, this big, but it will not have Lincoln on the cover. <laughs> it might. We don't know if it won't have Lincoln on the cover yet. You should have Lincoln on the cover. I think that would cover another demographic. We could. We can, we can add him to the plot. Absolutely. Um, and, Brian, why do you always have to one-up me? And oh. everyone, everyone has social media ROI, and I'm in a good mood even despite Brian's technological foibles because spring is almost here, as you can see from this happy felt flower. So that doesn't really have anything to do with Olivier, but I thought I would bring it up because it's important to me. I thought it was my action figure. This? If I had an action figure, I would want it to be that flower. That fla well, It's me. I mean, it's, it's uncanny. It's, when I think of Olivier Blanchard, I think of happy, pastel, always smiling, cheerful to a fault. Exactly. And so, yeah. Yeah, there it is. By um, the way, can you guys hear Chico barking right now? No. Oh, that's too bad. Is he sad? Does he want to be on? No, yeah. no, he's not sad. There must be somebody outside. Oh. Somebody committed um, the ultimate transgression to exist somewhere chihuahuas, within the vicinity of our property. Chihuahuas think that they're very large dogs. I, I like chihuahuas. Um, and what else? Olivier swims with octopi uh, and makes movies with them and then abandons them ruthlessly and makes me sad. And um, Olivier is working on a show for AMC called Breaking <laughs> Dead, which needs to happen. And um, what other great things have Actually, happened? we're changing it. We're upgrading it to uh, Breaking Dead Banshee. <laughs> nice. It's going to be a co-production with Cinemax. It's going to be pretty awesome. Oh, with Cinemax. Well, I'm going to have to resign. Um, so I was only going to be sweeping the floors anyway. Anyway, <laughs> um, what I'm hoping, what I'm hoping, in an ideal world, what I would want to talk to Olivier about is um, the presentation topic that he did down in Austin, Texas, um, and all the different ways that businesses can become social businesses. However, I'm a realist, and I'm looking at the crowd here before me, and I'm thinking we probably won't talk about that. But uh, though I shudder to say it, Olivier, you have the floor for as long as you can hold it. As long as you can hold it. I like that. As long as I can hold it. Um yeah, no, I mean, if, if, if you guys want to talk about that, it's just, you know, there's nothing wrong with social marketing. Uh, basically, social marketing is just, it's marketing on social channels with a little bit more human contact and, and dialogue, so it's, it's not exactly like regular marketing, but it's, so it's good. It's, it's a nice addition to a marketing program for any company. Uh, 
But if that's all you're doing, even if you're doing it exceptionally well, it's not enough. It's not social business. You're, if you're not doing social customer service, for instance, or not using social channels to enhance your social, your customer service or customer support uh, uh, business, then you're, you're really seriously missing out. Uh, if you're not using it for product management, if you're not using it for business development, if you're not using it for HR, PR, everything else, um, if, if essentially you're not incorporating social channels and social technologies into every facet of your business, whether it's externally facing, so you're having a contact with your customers or your clients, or internally facing where it aids collaboration and helps kind of break down silos a little bit, uh, you're really missing out. You're, you're only really focusing on one wedge of a very big pie. And, and ultimately, it won't be really all that successful. I mean, you'll, you'll get to a point where you hit a wall, and a lot of companies already have, where they're, they've shifted some of their spending from traditional to, uh, to social, and now they're realizing that it's not really working. They have no idea why. And so now they're creating this weird hybrid of uh, social advertising and promoted posts and, and whatnot that's really not driving anything. Um, very few companies are seeing any results there. So it's, uh, I think it's a shame. So that's what I talked about, basically. Now, did you say that you were doing both? You're actually, because I've seen this also, where people are actually focusing on social internally as well. Yeah. Right? So uh, are you folks, on, do you stress that as well, trying to make it a social organization, kind of like you know, what Mark Roman talks about in his book as well, just trying to turn it social internally as well as external facing? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's harder because, you know, when, when I get brought in, usually it's to, to fix a problem. Uh, the, the, the companies that hire me typically have already begun in their social business journey uh, in some way, shape, or form. So they're working with an agency or they have an internal department that's, that's kind of handling it. Um, and so typically what they're still looking for is either how to get more likes or how to get more traction with the KPIs that they're tracking on social now. Um, or they've, they've evolved a little bit more, but I've, I've never had a company come to me directly asking for, hey, ca how can we use social technologies to uh, facilitate collaboration between, you know, 15 satellite offices? Or how do we get, how do we use social to get marketing to talk to product development and sales? That's never happened. Um, it's, it, it's you, you arrive there by default. If you're doing what you need to be doing in developing social capabilities and, and uh, uh, social knowledge inside an organization and, and you start infusing everything they do, all their operations, with it, then it, it doesn't take long for you to start working there. But it's never, or it's at least in my experience, it's, I would say it's very, very rarely the, the, the main area of focus. Uh, people might intellectualize it, they might understand that it's something that needs to happen, uh, but it's, it's not something they try to do. And it's, it's unfortunate because we kind of go about it backwards. We try to build this social marketing skin first, this whole communications piece of, of PR, marketing, advertising, messaging, and, and outwardly communications before we really start doing the work of how can we become a more social organization first and then kind of export that through our communications channels. Uh, and and that's, that's why it takes so long and why it's so difficult. We're starting with the outside and working our way in when we should be starting on the inside working our way out. That's why I like to humanize a lot and I guess your book was okay too because um, I think both of those books really make the point that, you know, first you have just this huge social media thing and trying to understand all of the different levels and platforms and how you use it and how not to be a jackwad and all of that stuff and then how that intersects with business and how you can use that effectively and those are two huge issues and to be able to wrap your arms around all of that at one time while actually running your business can be quite the challenge. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, you know, there, there, there are two ways of looking at this. So one is I understand my business and I want to know how to stop doing the bad things I'm doing 
and I want to know how to st how to start doing a lot of the the good things I'm doing even better, right? So there's there's areas of improvement, and then there's uh, <laughs> there's actually they're all areas of improvements, I guess. But there's either do more of the good stuff or do less of the bad stuff. So you have to know what they are. If you don't know what those things are, you can definitely use social to find out, uh, either by asking the public directly or just doing some active monitoring to listen to what they're saying. So already there's that. And the focus of that should be to try to become not the best social media company, not the social best social business, but to take your company and make it as good a company as it can be. So if you're here and you want to be even better, use social in, in any way that you can to become a better company. Um, whether that means you know using it for market intelligence or business intelligence to see where you need to focus your efforts first, identifying pain points for customers, not only yours but your your competitors as well. See if there's you know you don't have to be perfect, you just have to be a little bit better than everybody else. Um, you know what pain points can you eliminate? What uh, what hurdles can you break down or at least kind of iron out between the the discovery of your brand or a particular product and, and its ultimate purchase? Um, there's there's hundreds of ways that you can improve your company and and every company every organization should go into the social media experiment thing uh, with an eye towards becoming a better company not an eye towards getting a bunch of likes a bunch of followers getting a bunch of impressions or you know having some bogus social media case study to present at South by Southwest next year um, so yeah I think I was ranting there but if, if you have that focus and you, you your focus is to improve your company and to, to deliver specific results that matter then you'll find a way to use social in in a way that that will help you do that if you're not thinking that way, if you're basically boxed into this kind of social KPI thing of likes and followers and whatever, um, all you're going to do is create content. You're going to create marketing content that's social content, and you're going to push it out, and you're going to count comments and likes. And there's no value to that. Well, there's some value to that, but there's not a whole lot of value to that compared to all the other things that you can be doing. It seems like, and I don't know if you all will agree with this, but I've noticed this particularly over the last six months, where anything you talk about, whether it's politics, a, a hot issue in the news, social media, marketing, there is no such thing as gray area. People cannot seem to hold nuanced ideas. They can't seem to hold two ideas in their head at the same time for some reason. And I'm wondering if that's why issues like social media ROI are so hard because just a couple weeks ago in in Sam's biz forum chat we were talking about ROI and people said well if you're worried about making money your your work isn't going to be creative and you're not going to be <laughs> relating to people and I said but right. if you multitask you could actually do all of that at the same time so do people just like to be argumentative online do you all think or do they just not understand that you can do all of these things at one time? What's what's the problem there? No, damn it, and you're wrong, and I hate you for it. Let me unfollow you right now. Fine. <laughs> Bye. Good riddance, too. I hate people like you. I know. Likewise. So you are you asking me or are you asking that? the whole thing? No, I'm not talking to you anymore. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Score. I mean, I, right. uh, sorry, I think, Marge, it depends between who you're talking to. I mean, and me and you discussed that. The majority of conversation online go between the social media professionals, if they call themselves, not really between brands or brands or consumers to brands and so on and so on. And they're looking for, for um, attraction physically. That's why they like to put out the topics that are controversial, in my opinion. So. <laughs> You're such a sick turd. Uh... Well, and I don't know. We are still talking about ROI, but I do believe that ROI is possible to measure on social. I don't know why everyone is so against it except Oliver. I mean, it's easy to, to measure. Well, that's what I guess I'll talk to Olivier again since he's here. But, I mean, what, what is this mind block about? Well, the, the mind block, I think, is, is about, uh, well, it, it's, it's not about anything. I think it's, it's, it's a mixture of laziness and uh, just not knowing how to measure it, not knowing what it is, really. And because the, the vast majority of people who have gone to social media, what is that? 
Who Sorry. That's my loud typewriter. It's my, ty I mean, my typewriter. He's an angry voice. typer. It's um, because awesome. nobody wants to be accountable. That's what it's about. They don't that's want it to be measured. It's fun to work when you don't have any goals to hit. That's, that's exactly right. How long does that right. last? How long does that last before it ends As up long as these war? gurus and ninjas can make us all believe it. <laughs> Some people have been doing this for years. they throw the social media out with the bathwater then when they, when they give that up though, right? Well, of course. That's what's destroying the whole industry. Yeah. <laughs> You know, also, the prob you know what's the problem? The problem is the gurus that you're saying. Because four years ago, they used to serve the coffee at Danny's or McDonald's. You <laughs> don't even know how to spell ROI. At, at Danny's? That's what the problem is. <laughs> well, out here in Vegas, it's that, you know, they go out and, and tweet about getting drunk. And so they have, you know, a few thousand followers because they tweet about going to the clubs, running into the celebrities. So they can make it work for your business, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, so yeah, I think it's it's a combination of all those things. Now, not everybody in social is is completely inept and incompetent. Um, a lot of the gurus, it's true. If you look at their resumes, they've never really worked for anybody. Uh, they they just don't have the the background, either educational or professional, to really understand how the stuff works. In theory, they can talk, but they've never actually put it in practice, and that's a problem. But, and but with a lot of what? I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, it's all snake oil. I mean, it really frustrates Danny Brown always says, go look at LinkedIn and see what they were doing before 2006, and you have your answer yeah. right there. Yeah. So, well, let, me, um, let, me ask, let me ask you this, Olivia. So, you've got, uh, I mean, you know, sometimes when you're a, a consultant, then you want to be the second one in because they screwed it up so bad. And, yeah, you got to deal with that, but you kind of get to be the savior. But in the case of social media, I don't know if they get a second try a lot of times, does it? it? It either it either runs its course and they're like, crap, we can't do anything of this, and they just throw it away, or does it still help to be the second one in now that people have been burned once and actually will listen to reason? Right. Now, can you, can you guys still see me, by the way? Yeah. Okay. I'm having some issues, but that's all right. Um, oh. At least I can see you guys, so that's good. What? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, I I think no personally, I don't like being the second guy. I'll tell you why. Um, first, because it's actually it's a lot easier to fix the mistakes. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, it's harder to fix the mistakes than it is to to do it right the first time. And two, by the time I get there, um, two things have happened. One, the budget's already blown. Yep. So the the guy who screwed it up before me got paid, and I am getting a fraction of what he's getting, and I'm working twice as hard because I have to to swim upstream now. And two, the company is, uh, you know, it, it's its kind of like you're the rebound guy after somebody had a really bad relationship and their boyfriend was beating them. So now they're they are really reluctant to try anything. They're skeptical. They've been burned once and they don't want to get burned again. So, no, it's, it's a horrible situation. I mean, it's good because I get the business, but I'd much rather get the business first. That way we have a chance to do it right and, and you know, do... Like what Scott Monty did, Scott Monty didn't go to Ford as the second guy. He went to Ford as the first guy, and it worked out super, super well. Uh, and I don't think, uh, as, as strong as he is and as great as his team is, I don't think that he would have gotten the support um, and, and some of the results that he had as quickly as he did and as smoothly as he did uh, had he come after somebody who had royally screwed it up for Ford before well, Although I will have to say, I am working with a, a client right now who um, had a social media consultant that, well, I don't know that she was a cons I'm not really sure what she did. She set it up so every time our client wrote a blog, it would automate to Facebook, automate to LinkedIn, automate to Twitter, automate to Google+. And then she had it set up so that Twitter would also automate LinkedIn and Facebook so you would have the same thing going out in different formats three to four times. Then she stopped reporting how much that wasn't working for them. So in that situation, it is kind of nice to be able to get insight into what some people are selling as social media services, even if, you know, as Olivier says, it's it's hard to fix the mistakes and everything. You can get a lot of insight into what companies are buying and what they're being told um, so that you can maybe better present things to new companies and, and know what you're up against, I guess. Right. Well, yeah, to, to go back to the, uh, the, the previous question that kind of like turned into this one too, um, it, it's not so much that 
you know, a, a lot of, of social media gurus or experts or consultants or whatever really don't know what they're doing and they don't know how to apply social into a, a business environment outside of just creating content and, mm -hmm. you know, organizing feeds. One of the reasons why they don't measure anything outside of likes, impressions, whatever, is because um, uh, on the one hand, yes, yeah, some of them are lazy and they don't want to be able to, they don't want to be responsible for <laughs> for actual results uh, so they're only going to really measure variations of reach that that are easy to measure with uh, with social and and metrics that can either either easily be fudged or be inflated to mean something that they don't really mean um, but but there's a parallel with that a, a lot of these folks the ones who didn't come out of SEO and multi-level marketing the ones who don't have a, a downline the ones who actually came out of marketing or advertising or PR tend to focus on reach metrics because that's all they've ever been taught and that's all they've ever been really gold on it's all about impressions um, whether you're selling advertising you know on, on a billboard or on television or radio or Facebook it's about the impressions and and in a digital world it's about the visits to the websites or the click-throughs so um, it, it's it's not necessarily that um, that they don't know what they're doing, but it's endemic of of their training and of their background to focus exclusively on these uh, these very light superficial metrics, and not to dig deeper and try to connect the dots between, okay, we did this, and then we had the impressions, and then we had the click-throughs and the store visits, and then it ended up translating into these sales. And um, they they don't know how to do that. They're not driven to do that. No one has ever asked them to do that. You know what's the problem, Oliver? Um, I was talking to a couple of guys that they came out of advertisement and that they still run an agency. And one of the CFOs, CFOs said to me that, well, I have a problem. In traditional, I have a TRPs and GRPs that I can look into. In social, I have nothing. And I think that's the main problem that they're having. They're trying to compare traditional TRPs to the social impressions. Yeah. And to explain to them that it's not the same, they just don't get it because they're like, well, it took us four theories, four theories in traditional to get them, right? So, and then apparently Nielsen is coming with something out. I don't know how right. that would work, but <laughs> some of the formulas. Everybody's are coming out with something. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it, it, and, and everybody's, every business is different, and, and every activity is supposed to be driving different types of outcomes or behaviors from the consumer. So you have to measure them in different ways. Um, I remember there was a, I don't remember. It was, I was in Toronto, and I can't remember what the context was, but I was watching this presentation, and this guy, um, this guy was, I guess, with an ad agency or something, and it was it, he was talking about a case study, something that they did, a campaign or an ad, during a hockey game, and I don't know if it was some kind of playoff game or what, but they wanted to gauge the amount of people who were watching the advertising during the breaks versus people who were basically going out and you know going to the bathroom basically and just you know having a pee break um, between their beers and, and, and during commercial breaks and what they did is they didn't try to go through a formula or whatever they didn't they didn't go into media they they tapped into water usage on a timeline for different municipalities so I think it was for the city of Toronto they showed it and they showed water usage on a timeline and they put the advertising time slots on that timeline and they were looking at how much water was being used hence how many times toilets were being flushed <laughs> and so they, they they averaged out the average flush uh, figured out how many people were flushing and that gave them a percentage of their audience that was in the bathroom doing something and not watching the advertising and I thought that was, I mean, it's not going to give you like super specific metrics, but I thought that was really clever. And, and that's the type of mental approach that people in, in our business should, should take in order to measure what it is they're trying to measure. Um, not just go by the likes and the follows and the KPIs and the advertising world's um, formulas and, and algorithms, but try to find all those little bits of data that they can put together to see what people are actually doing in response to a message or a piece of content or a suggestion or a blog or whatever it is. Uh, did you hear for socialguide.com? 
I just saw it today, I will put in a chat. Check it out, it's physically, they're, they're measuring the buzz between the TV and social. It's, I just saw it today, it's quite new, it's quite interesting, something to, to look into. Yeah. I think you would you would like to see how it goes. I will I'll look into it. But yeah, so there's I, there's there's a lack of of innovation. There's a lack of imagination. Uh, I think in and definitely in, in the social marketing world, uh, social customer service is very different already. Um, but there's it's almost like nobody's really trying to figure out how to do this. Everybody's sort of getting by with the easy metrics and just getting the paycheck and creating the content and just moving on to the next client or the next day. And and so we're we're not evolving, and there's there's this weird kind of cadre, of um, of influencers and bloggers, that that's made a good living off of of perpetuating the cycle, and they're not going to rock the boat. It's it's not necessarily that they don't know how to measure stuff or how to get real results, but there's no incentive. What? Do you guys hear that? <laughs> no. No. Wow. Okay. I've got opera going on and dogs howling. Um, yeah, I think there, there's an incentive to <laughs> to keep things the way they are, uh, and and to perpetuate this cycle of uh, I don't know uh, social media rock stars and and just apathetic social measurement schemes that that don't really go anywhere. It's it's I I don't believe that we've we're in 2013, and we're still debating ROI by accident. I don't so think so. We, um, um, when I worked for an engineering company, I first came out of college, and you know, you sit there and you, you're putting all your energy into it, and then one guy said that there is a point in time in a project to where your profit margin isn't going to be near as much. So doing all the business analysis and stuff up front is where you make a lot of the money. As soon as you actually start getting to the execution mm -hmm. where things can really go wrong, you know, you, you got a chance to lose a lot of money. So in some cases, they were okay if a project got killed after all the analysis was done, because that's why they made all their margin. And so when we're looking at social media, do you have the rock stars come in and like get all these different things set up and tell them what metrics to track, and then they jump off, mm -hmm. and then when the company fails, they're going to be like, well, you didn't follow my methodology. And, right. and you know, so and kind of wash your hands of it, but still be the rock star, right? Because they show. Do you see that happening, or? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I'm the guy they call afterwards. Yeah, yeah exactly. you forgot so to read my book. The biggest because... margin. Yeah, yeah. Then you come in and, and get the the dregs, basically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I you know I I don't mind, but it's yeah, it's pretty frustrating. Um, but that I can handle. I mean, it's 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 not a big deal. And like I said, I mean, it's it's nice to be able to fix it. Um, I mean, nobody wants to be the surgeon who has to correct a bad nose job. Um, but I mean, that's that's high risk, low pay, and uh, and you're still going to end up with something that's not going to be as good as it should have been to begin with. Um, but what what annoys me is is these discussions that we keep having, or these these quote unquote debates about ROI. Um, on, on the one hand, you've got people who are like, well, it's not about ROI, it's not about the money, it's about the conversations and the engagement. Yes, it is if you're a community manager, but for the overall business, for the people paying the community manager's paycheck, there has to be something else attached to that. Unless the company is just super social and then ROI is never going to be an issue, no one's ever going to ask for it, and so it's completely irrelevant to begin with. Um, and then on the other end of that spectrum, you have all the, the returns on influence and return on engagement and this BS that um, that that muddies the water, that obscures the real point, uh, and that confuses a whole lot of people. Uh, I think that ROI is is a very specific thing. It's it's financial. It's it's an equation. It doesn't change uh, depending on whether you're talking about social media or traditional media or anything else. You throw money into a program. There's money that comes in at the end. There's an equation to figure out what the ratio of that is. Um, and that's all it is. And it's it's a very specific wedge in that measurement pie that answers a very particular question for uh, for senior management, for the people who are actually making decisions on how to spend their money. It's not the end all be all of what you should measure. Um, it's it's almost irrelevant to any kind of PR process. Um, if you're doing straight marketing or straight customer service and you're not trying to drive sales. ROI may be absolutely the wrong metric to even look at. 
Um, but it's it's really important to have that discussion early on and say, okay, this is what ROI is, and this is how we're going to measure it for this particular thing. But if you're looking at all the other outcomes, you know, positive mentions, um, you know, uh, uh, an improvement in brand perception, uh, an improvement in brand recall or intent to buy, and you haven't really made that connection with a sale or with a cost reduction inside of the company, it's irrelevant. But, but you have to be able to separate ROI from everything else and know what you're measuring and why. Um, that, that's the most crucial thing. We don't need to Olivia, redefine ROI. I'm going to interrupt you for a second. I'm yeah. about to have a special moment here. I'm going to talk to Brandy face to face for the first time ever. <laughs> Hi, Brandy! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Am. Jeez. Okay, Olivier, <laughs> I have a question for you. Yeah. What do you mean ROI isn't applicable with a fully social company? I'm sorry, what? Okay, so you... Oh, oh okay, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking okay. about, yeah. Yeah, um, come on, well, go back. No, no, it's, it's applicable, it's applicable, but it, it may not be an issue. Um, so if, if you have, a, for example, like a non-profit, they're not really selling anything, and they, they're, they're operating basically on, on grants, 100%. They're not raising money, they're not selling t-shirts, they just want people to be aware, like to create awareness for something, they're not looking for donations, whatever. Um, and they're just, you know, they're, they're all about that raising that awareness. They're, they're not necessarily going to care about ROI. They're just not. Um, some companies might look at their social activities, their activity on social channels, even if they're for profit, and, um, and just want to be there as a kind of, you know, customer support, customer service uh, function, but not actually try to drive sales. They, they might have the expectation that if they're there for their customers and they have that relationship with them and they're, they're buddies with them essentially and they create a really cool kind of digital offline online experience with their customers that the business will naturally come because they're enhancing that relationship and creating value. Um, you might have a CEO and, and, and a group of executives who say we're not going to bother measuring the ROI we know intrinsically, instinctively, that this is going to work, that this benefits the company, that it improves everything about our company. We understand that. We're not going to try to put a number on it. We're just going to do it because we know it's good. So, so in that context, you don't necessarily need to go chase it. If nobody cares, don't. Um, but with, with most brands, most companies, somebody is going to ask that question because they have to justify the budget. They have to take money out of marketing or out of somebody else's pot and say, okay, we need to hire community managers, we need to do all this social stuff, we have to have these monitoring dashboards. All that's expensive, and that's coming out of these other budgets, and we have to be able to justify why. We have to be able to say, we invested in social because we wanted to drive business, and at the end of the year or at the end of the, uh, uh, the, the time frame, we need to be able to correlate, at least, not necessarily prove, but show some kind of improvement that we can tie back to that investment. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a different philosophy. The, the default, I think, is that. But in some cases, you might have companies that basically say, screw it, we're not going to bother measuring it. It's, we know it's a positive, so we'll just keep going with it. Does that make sense? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, I have a company like that. Um, now, as, as a, a social media professional, whoever is in charge of that program, if, if there is an owner for that program, or at least an owner of the budget, it, it might not be a bad idea to go ahead and, and try to measure it in some way, um, just in case a new CEO comes in, new investors, new board of directors, somebody at some point might ask the question. Or things might go wrong, your budgets might get cut, you might have to start prioritizing who do I fire, who do, whose budgets do I shrink. And, and it's, it's, it's important, I think, if you're a decision maker to know where your money is best spent when you have to cut 10 or 12, 20% of it. Uh, where are you going to cut that money? What programs are most important to my bottom line and to, to driving business? And which ones could potentially be sidelined or... or um, made a little bit smaller. So uh, as a precautionary measure, I, I, I'd suggest that companies at least, even if they don't want to understand what the ROI of what they're doing is, um, they should be aware of it anyway, just in case that, uh, that those bad days come. 
and generally they, they do sooner or later. Right. I just want to take a moment and point out that this might be the scariest grouping of people we've ever had on a heckler's hangout. <laughs> just immensely frightening to everyone here, I think. Yeah. Um, so, Brian, should we uh, start being mean to Olivier at this point? I think we've given him adequate time to um, give Christy the Christy the social media say what was it the social media? Oh Christ! Um, what? What the hell is that? Ah. <laughs> okay. so, I guess that's uh, an answer. So, uh, Amy, why don't we start with you and just, you know, shoot from the hip? As you pro did as you, you just read? Did you, you just read my last statement? I'm totally. What did you just ask me? I have two children here. I'm about to murder. <laughs> I have two children. I'm about to kill. Well, don't do that on a hangout. I don't want to be a witness. I'm trying to wait until it's over. Casey. Yeah, keep in mind, this is being broadcast, so it's not even just you doing this. <laughs> this would be great. I've always wanted to be on HLN for six months. Goodness. <laughs> I have no questions right now if that's what no you're looking questions. for. All I have right. lots of snark. That's all I've got at this hour. Snark's good. Yeah. All I got. Snark works well in this audience. You know that. Snark is the lifeblood of most of us. I will sure. shout my question out rudely when someone else is asking something. Okay, good. Rock on. Angela. Oh, so let's... We could have gone over to Stacy then, so she could have been wrote to Stacy. Oh, that's saying. true. Stacy brings out the snark in all of us. Hi, Stacy. Stacy. Oh, here he is on now me. He's gonna do that glare thing again. What is uh -huh. it, with people? There he is. <laughs> Stacy, now say something intelligent. What? <laughs> now he's back. <sighs> Anything intelligent? Anything. Tall order. Got nothing. Yeah. <laughs> no. Damn, I, I'm glad you guys came prepared. No. I got you awesome. We're all on here for the snarky <laughs> chat on the side. <laughs> I like the question that you put in the comment section, though. Is that the girl from the ring? <laughs> Not so okay. Sam, oh, buddy, go. join that and Amy. Her sure daughter was behind her. No, that's the that's the neighbor kid. I think you're talking about. Uh oh. Hey, Stacy. I am staring into your soul. By the way. That's good. <laughs> Sam, what you got, buddy? Brian, well, I don't have too much. A, I just joined in, and I don't want to be rude and, uh, you know, sort of mess things up. I, I just oh, I wanted to be... Oh, oh, shut up, Margie. You shut this up, Sam. This is the one community oh, where you're asked to be rude. <laughs> and you well, are so right. I, I, I don't want to be rude. I, oh, honestly, Randy. I don't understand why everybody expects me to be rude all the time. I, I, I wanted to be here because... Um, I, I really want to get a, a sense of what ROI is because in social media it's all about return on relationship, not return on <laughs> investment. So I'm here to be educated. Margie, mute, mute your mic. <laughs> so I'll, I'll ask a I'll ask kind of a loaded question because I wrote a I wrote a, a, a post for Shelley Kramer and then that got a, a whole guest discussion going, and then somebody else wrote a post as a result. Is, uh, uh, is Shelly Kramer that desperate that she's asking you to write blog posts for us? Yes. <laughs> no. Come on now. She let me write a blog post. She's a nice gal. She let me write you a couple of them. You let me write a post uh, for her. But I brought, up, I brought up the thing about, you know, people are talking about you, and it's not in the survey. So um, my question to you uh, is, when you go in, what, what data sources do you kind of help them consider? I mean, obviously, we, we're sitting here on this conversation talking social media ROI, social media marketing, or, or whatever that may be. But, you know, then there's surveys. And, and my argument has been I never fill out a survey. I never take the receipt home and log in. I never take the little sheet. I have a pen handy. I, I, I never do those things. If in, in the case studies we have, when people have a bad experience, they don't go log into the corporate website or, or pull out the receipt and put it on their phone and, and do the little survey. They just blow you up on Twitter or yep. Facebook or whatever the social channel is. So um, what do you see when you go in? Do, do you think that people have a pure play on social channels, review sites, that kind of thing? Or do those other data sources still come into hey, play? In that let, me, let me say something before you... Before you Answer that. Uh, 
there's something that I, I, I actually kind of, I think I got a, a little bit pissed off a client possibly, but I told them that the only thing about surveys and the market research that you do, the thing is, is that nobody ever takes in consideration, and it's really hard to do, is human nature. You can, That's not you can, hard to do, I'm sorry, it's easy. I'm sorry? I said it's not hard to do the human nature, it's easy to do it. People don't know how to do it. Uh, but I mean, you it's know, called what I, no, it's called it's called ethnography. You go in with a ethnographer and you do it. You get out human nature and, and behaviors. I don't, I don't know about that. Yuri, because, because it's not linked to numbers. Because I mean, stop and think about what Brian is. The the example Brian's bringing up is because you know what if you you get a room an example, you get a a, a panel of people in there. Say you you know it's eleven people, three people out of there got either a car wreck, stepped in dog poop, listened to Margie cough, or you know something that has really put them in a bad state of mind. So everything is going to be possibly negative on a survey that they take. So, I mean, that's that's something that you I don't think you can plan for. Yeah. Well, I can, I can answer that part of the question. I, I don't do surveys. I don't manage market research like that. Um, I have in the past, and, and when I did, I, I hired people to do it for me. So I just don't want to deal with it. Um, so it <laughs> what I'm more interested in now is, uh, first of all, monitoring and, and listening on social channels uh, to what people are saying. And hey, where's uh, Amy going? What? She, she walks in and out on occasion. It's oh, okay. No, 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 I'm listening. I just put the yeah. dog out. Sorry. So, um, so yeah, I'm 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 not a market research guy who's going to go out and do the surveys. There there are companies that can do that uh, for the client, and I'd, I'd rather that they work with them. It's just not my forte. Um, but but now you can listen to what people are saying about your company. Uh, whether you're using, you know, whatever the tool is. Um, so, Margie, don't laugh. So, um, what? That what? But but it's it's not that hard to figure out what people are complaining about or what they don't like because they're they're generally not going to be specific about what they like about your company online. They're going to like you. They're going to promote you. They're going to talk about you. They're going to say, "Oh, stellar uh, customer service or awesome experience today at you know so and so," and that's it. And that's nice. But when something goes wrong, um, they're going to tell you exactly what went wrong yeah. in, in detail. So it's already every time you have something like this, it's you have two things. If you're just paying attention, if if you have that set up, one is um, you have a customer service opportunity to fix it. Uh, whether you do it privately or you do it through, you know, the channel that they use, so it's it's a little bit more public. That's totally up to you, and it depends on on the situation. So that's the first thing, the customer service opportunity. The second one is the identification of pain points. You start seeing the same problems happen again and again, or the com same complaints again and again. You know, you've got a problem. You know, you've got to fix it. That goes back inside the organization to whoever owns that experience that became a problem. So it's not even a marketing issue. Already, by doing that, by listening, you're improving uh, company processes in a way and, and maybe identifying problems that, that HR wasn't aware of, uh, that, that sales and marketing and business development weren't uh, aware of, or, or even your product group, right? It could be a quality control issue. It could be like people complaining about how hard the packaging is to remove from your products. It could be all kinds of stuff. Um, but what was the question again? <laughs> What, well, how did we start? No, wait, seriously, how did we start before we got into the surveys? You we started out with surveys. Was it about, is, was it the survey? Yeah. Well, well, um, we started out with surveys and, and you know, because I ended up backing off my stance a little bit and saying, okay, you know, it's good for those that will take the time and you can kind of conform it on whatever, you know, grading scale you want and what specifics right. you want. And, and so oh, I know what it was. I know what it was. You were asking me what kind of data I look at. Sure. Um, so, you know, if obviously if there's a problem like this, we look at that and, and we try to identify the problem so we can solve them. But it's we kind of look at whatever data they have. Um, you know, what are they tracking now and why are they tracking it? That's always important. So with, with B2B, for instance, I find that the data is usually extremely good. With B2C, you don't necessarily know who you're selling to. 
you don't know, for instance, that um, how many times a particular customer comes into your store necessarily. You just know that you have a bunch of sales. Uh, but unless they swipe their card or they use an app or something to, to check in, you're not going to know that, that Joe Smith went into your coffee shop 20 times this week unless you're paying attention because you're the proprietor and you just have a really good memory. Um, with B2B though, you have your clients or your customers' purchase histories. You have that behavior. and So you can look over time, you can parse through that data and look at the customers whose purchasing patterns are accelerating in terms of either volume or velocity and you have uh, groups of customers that you can kind of batch as the customers who used to buy once a month and who are now only buying quarterly or who used to buy you know on average you know two thousand dollars per order and they've now shrank it to like twelve hundred and so when you start to look at that that kind of data if you can if you can identify it um, then you can start to look for patterns and you can start digging a little bit deeper especially if you have a good relationship with them if you don't social is good the phone is good email is good whatever it is and and find out what happened is it price is it somebody you know got into an argument with them or just rubbed them the wrong way is uh, your competitor doing something that's that's winning that business that's the kind of stuff that I look at um, and it has nothing to do with Facebook or Twitter um, I, I end up I know I know Sam's like shot um, but but I look at the problems that they have with their business the social media for me is a tool to help identify these problems or these opportunities help address them uh, help spread their message and, and, and help basically enhance every single business function that they already have. Uh, but for me, it's not the end-all, be-all. It's just you've got the telephone, you've got email, you've got face-to-face, -face, you've got your brick and mortar, and you've got social. Um, and, and I try to help them put all that together and, and solve their problems. So, I, that, I mean, I'm not, that's why I'm not really a social media guy. I'm on social media, but um, I'm a business whisperer or something. Oh, he has a new name for the. You know Wii. what? That's that'd be great. <laughs> Watch the hell out of the brand builder. Um, but but so Sam, to answer your question earlier, because you were, I don't know if you were being facetious, um, but but the ROI thing is is measured in, in different ways. What? <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> okay. Sorry about that, Olivier. No, no, no problem, Stacy. Um, so it's a. Uh, no, it's it, it's you have to measure it based on the activity, and and the activity should be created whether it's content or a campaign or or whatever should be created and funded with at least certain objectives in mind. Even if they end up pushing, you know, or driving like thirty or forty different objectives and they overlap and it's very complicated. Every once in a while, you want to test um, what your your activity on specific channels can actually drive. And so um, it's it's really complicated to measure ROI on a 24/7 basis, right? Kind of like an EKG where you're looking at a bunch of charts and seeing, like, looking for correlations. You can, but it's only going to take you so far. You're only going to start to see patterns. It's not going to prove anything. But every once in a while, instead of the EKG, you want to kind of like go and and take a biopsy. So for 24 or 48 hours, you want to have a, a campaign or a specific thing like a tweet, uh, a Facebook update, an email. Test all of your channels with a particular code um, that's unique to those channels but for the same offer. And put a timestamp on it so there's a beginning and an end and see what happens. See what it drives. And you know a percentage of those messages will just get lost and won't drive a thing. So it could be that 60% of your audience doesn't doesn't ever find out about it, and that's good to know as well. And for the other 40% who actually come into the store or visit your website or click on a link, you can track back to that particular purchase code, to that particular URL, um, and you can see exactly, first of all, hopefully who they are, uh, but if not, at least you can see what... what um, what behaviors that drove from the click through to the visit to the store all the way to the actual transaction and so you have the numbers of transactions that can go up hopefully you have the volume of sales that goes up you if if you have pretty decent control over what your inventory is and what you're actually selling you might be able to see if for example you had a sale on a red item 
uh, if your sales on the red item went up, you know, 7% during that time period and track that back to where people uh, uh, reported that they, uh, they were prompted to make the purchase or which path they took if you can measure that directly. Um, the, the caveat there is that a lot of times it will, their decision to make the purchase or their, um, uh, the way that they found out about the event or the special sale or, or whatever uh, is overlaps. It, they found out about it through Facebook and Twitter and through email and through advertising, right? They might have seen it on TV, heard it on the radio, seen it across like five or six channels. And um, it's, it's actually not that difficult if you can work with your, um, uh, with your retail staff, especially at the checkout, not so much digitally but in, in the real world, brick and mortar, to find out, to actually have them ask, hey, you brought the coupon, it was like, is Facebook like where you actually got it? Um, or you know you had the code or whatever and and when you ask them even if they've seen it on three or four different channels they will naturally tell you which one was the most influential for them so even though they saw it on Twitter and Facebook or whatever they'll say yeah I saw the thing on Facebook and so if you yeah, enter that I, into the I think CRM system approach, Olivier. what's that? Um, I think that makes I understand what you're saying and it, it makes total sense and I can see it working um, I was being a little facetious, uh, facetious earlier with the, the the relationship thing. I was just taking a cheap shot at somebody, uh, but <laughs> what I do is it, well, that's what I do. I take cheap shots at people. No, but I actually have a serious point. Um, what I wanted to say is that I look at it, or the way that I've sort of evolved it is, if I can measure that activity that you're talking about in your EKG or looking at these spikes, even that is a very is a snapshot. Yeah. I've been measuring everything to CLV, customer lifetime value. Yeah. And of course that takes a lot longer to do and I've you know, I've been lucky that I've got clients that I will allow me to do that. Not everybody does, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But I find that that's a much stronger measurement if you're going to measure because then you get out of the uh, the 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 brand versus performance marketer debate. And yeah. you're saying, okay, well, yes, yeah, some things are just for the warm and fuzzy, but when you take a look at it in conjunction with all of these other practices, at the end of a six months, at the end of the year, has that combination increased or decreased lifetime value? Yeah. No, I, I totally oh, agree. I mean, if, I if you can do that, you. you're really lucky. Uh, it's, yeah, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to do that in B2B. Um, that's, that's fairly easy to do. With B2C... It's it's tricky unless you have a company that basically people like I said you know they have a membership or something like Costco or whatever and you know exactly who's buying what when. Um, but if if you haven't trained your customers or you haven't created a system by which you know who's buying what when or you haven't incentivized to to tell you and you're not tracking that in your CRM system, um, that's that's really hard to do. So I, I you have to go with the uh, the, the EKG and the uh, uh, and the biopsy. But the, the lifetime customer value is absolutely the, the, the strongest way to do it, uh, if you can. I, but it's, it's the promise of, of true social CRM, though, being able to combine yeah, that, that consumer um, behavior and that data and then the social data as well with all the interrelationships, the, uh, the, the affinities with brands and, and, and particular types of, of thought processes and values that are associated with brands uh, and bringing all that together. Um, we're not quite hey, can uh, can we all congratulate uh, Sean McGinnis for having the courage to get on a video with so many men with full heads of hair? <laughs> <laughs> Notice he wow. turned off his light though, so we're not being blinded. That's that's a nice touch. That's I like that. So I, I do have a question, Olivia, about because um, uh, you keep bringing up B two B and, and how it's like cleaner data and so on. But how receptive are they to? Uh, a social strategy, a digital strategy, they're the ones that are more ingrained to, we'll do it the way we've always done it, and the chatter about their stuff seems to be much less than obviously a consumer product or a consumer service. I mean, do you see that? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, uh, the B2B tends to be a little bit more conservative uh, right. with the way to do things, a little bit more change averse. Um, but at the same time, they're, they're easier to work with because I come from the B2B world. I've had to deal with all that for many, many years. Um, so I, I, I know the mentality and I know the characters. Every time I walk into a, a conference room with these guys, I know who's who. And, and I know what their pain points are and I know what they're trying to accomplish. So 
if there's no BS, I don't have to try to figure out what the politics are. I don't have to try to figure out what you know how I'm going to get them to do it. Um, I, I just ask them what they want, and then we start doing little tests that are um, uh, not particularly risky, but just to give them data, to give them information, to give them context, and then find little problems that we can work on, fix them, come up with uh, with little basically proof of concept solutions, and start building on that. Um, B2B to me is, is easier. The, the problem is that social is less powerful for them. It's less relevant. Um, so the, the work that we end up doing is not particularly about Facebook or Twitter or, or, or YouTube or social. It's really about improving the company. We, we kind of steer away from, uh, from, from social. Whereas with a B2C company, um, they just want they want big numbers and they want big content uh, and their their goals their objectives are are actually the the pieces that are harder to define and harder to get them to agree on. So it's always something. Right. It just it just seems like whenever we're looking at doing an investment or getting them to consider an investment in any form of monitoring or whatever. You know, we always like to start collecting on them right away. Well, for B two B, the chatter is minimal. And B to C, yeah. you know, they've got hundreds of thousands of mentions to draw upon, so it, it makes for a more compelling argument on why they need to be in that space. Well, B to B, a lot of times too, is you need to have private communities. It's it's more of you know the the, the client communities. They don't necessarily want to be on the outside. Um, you want to create a, a user or a client community where they might be, especially if you're a services company, um, where you can help them come together and, and maybe join forces on certain projects, whether it's you know construction or IT distribution or whatever. Um, so you, you have to create where the find out what the value is for them, not just how to buy more stuff. What the hell? What? <laughs> Why is everybody laughing? I'm so impressed. Are you not looking at the chat? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm looking oh, at you guys. You're so smart because well, when Danny and I were on here, it was total chaos because that's all we did. So you couldn't. But I thought I was impressed. I thought you could see it, and you were still maintaining your seriousness. Oh no, no, it's it's there. I have it, but I'm not paying attention to it. I know better. Wow, I was really that's impressed, why, too, that's Olivier. Why, that's why you, you should have just post. lied. <laughs> Brandy, can you stand up? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, what? Yuri, really? Well, I'm just asking. You don't want to get Olivia started on that topic. I'm... Okay. He's going to start pulling out libraries. No, no, you're behind cut, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Mark, you be quiet. You, you can't be the quiet. One Why is everyone telling me to be quiet? We have tweets to talk about. Uh, okay, let's go. Let's talk about the I'm only here because we're talking about zombies. Olivia okay. was educating me on Walking Dead last hey, night. We have a call. The... Joe from Ohio says. <laughs> All right, and, and, Olivia. Yeah, we haven't even talked about zombies. I, I have an important question. I saw this yep. on Pinterest today. The question oh, shit. Is this. Oop, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, Brian's drinking. You usually drinking. hide that so well. He's always drinking. He's a yeah, but he hides it. Like my alcoholic neighbor, he's like has it on the side. He has a barrel with him. For Is it like one of those? Like, wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Margie. Okay, Margie, go ahead. Here's the question: If a full-grown zombie bites a baby. <laughs> Oh, a crawler instead of a walker. Can a what? What? Can do that? Can a zombie be a crawler instead of a walker? If if a baby gets bitten, wouldn't it be a crawler? It can't walk. If a baby gets bitten, I think it's going to get eaten. <sighs> mm. I think Just that thinking. if you develop he's, a strategy, he's, now he's right. Babies are you know tasty. They're tasty little morsels, but exactly. but there you go, you're this is a great way to grow an army because if you burn several babies, well, do they grow? I mean, I don't know. These are important questions. I don't think they would grow no, because they're, they're they would be like little landmines. You just don't want to step on the baby babies. Vampire, whatever you're when you're bitten, that's what you stay as. Margie, but wait, question: Are you sleeping with zombies? Yes. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> what? <laughs> Whatever Yuri says is true. Why is Brian a screen capture now? Ooh. You have Brian. to you have to have the survival guide. 
This is good Best stuff. Survival guide. Brian, why are you why what are you doing, Brian? What are you doing? Hey, we need a book called Zombie ROI. The ROI. Zombie ROI. ROI. There you okay. Go. There you go. I'll I'll talk to Catherine Bull about it. Yeah. Hey, if um <laughs> if if, zo if zombies had a cloak score, what would that cloak score be? Mm. Wow! If they probably have like an eighty-six one. about Boston or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it would have no relevance whatsoever. <laughs> well, no, think, wait a minute, um, because everything they do travels through their network, right? They bite somebody, and <laughs> that's pretty powerful stuff. You know, it's it's a good point because okay, so on The Walking Dead, every time a major character turns into a zombie, and you actually see these little flashes of you know zombies chewing through their heads, it's almost like there's a hive mind that we don't know about. It's really kind of primitive hive mind, so I don't know, maybe. Um, powerful buying behavior, you know, because I mean, hive mind, you get one to buy, everybody buys. Yeah. I think it would be 99 influential in Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> you guys ever considered the possibility that maybe Rick and his group are just basically deeply psychotic homeless people who took some bad drugs and <laughs> that the zombies are just regular people <laughs> trying to help them? <laughs> that was no, so like a lost ending. <laughs> oh, right. don't even get me start. I wasted so many years on that show. <laughs> okay, I did. So, oh, I right, got right, off the island fast. Talk, since we're on the zombie talk, I've never seen a moment of Walking Dead. How is it different from like Twenty Eight Days? Well, it's not nearly as smart. Okay. Well, no, so there's a problem with The Walking Dead. Some of the episodes are really good. Some of the characters really are pretty good. solid, but it's really inconsistent. So when they want the zombies to be dangerous and very deadly, then the zombies are dangerous and very deadly. They're, even though they weigh like a buck oh five because they're all rotten and there's nothing left but skin and bones, um, they'll still knock a grown man down. <laughs> but if they've decided that the zombies are basically just there to, to you know, be a background and uh, just to kind of you know, be there and, and pose a, a meager threat, then all of a sudden you can just basically walk right past them or shove them out of the way. Um, sometimes their nails are so sharp that they can cut a man in half and kill you, and then sometimes you know, people walk around in T-shirts and get almost scratched and bitten and nothing happens, and they don't seem to be particularly worried about it. So the, the show's writing is, is really inconsistent um, in, in the sense that... Um, the, the threat is never really all that level. Um, you know, evidently now, in, in the first season, you kind of had to really jam something in their eye socket to destroy the part of the brain that keeps them animated. <laughs> now you could basically, like, poke a little, <clears throat> a, a knitting needle through their, their, uh, through their eardrum and they drop. So, yeah. um, so there are some problems that they probably need to fix. It's, it's well, getting a little annoying. How do you really feel? It's updated on her status. Yeah. So she's very disappointed in this season's writing. <laughs> But yeah. wait, <laughs> guys, but wait Oliver, that? you said that you come in to fix the problem, so... Well, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to come in and, and fix the problem for AMC, yeah. yeah if you know. hey, guys, yeah, hey, everyone, can I uh, take a second to point out that even the chick that's going through chemo has more hair than Sean McGinnis does? <laughs> <laughs> and he turned wow. the light on now, so now we're blinded. we got the yeah. nice little orange glow. <laughs> At it. Let's talk about Sean's dream of becoming a rock star. It's just a bad. It's just it's an erotic star. <laughs> Me and Phil Collins, you know. <laughs> oh, the no, Genesis reunion. <laughs> no, when Phil when Phil gets killed in a car crash, I'm going to take over. Even though I don't know how to play the drums, I'm convinced I would be excellent. You know, just, he you know, you know, you know he retired, bro. <laughs> You know, Sean has no hair in the whole. Time. I'm still waiting for him to die, and then I'll pick him, pick up the sticks. You know. Remind me to tell you a story about him next week, Sean. All right. I'm Peter sure we'll Gabriel, have many stories time. Peter Gabriel shaved the uh, the head off too, right? It's because he was going bald. Yeah. Duh. I thought it was just a, a fashion. You think all choice. none of us really shave it by choice? I mean, no. No. I did once. It wasn't good. Yeah. It wasn't good. And see, you're so clean shaven now versus the rest of us. The rest of us are, you know, sporting. I, sport. you know, listen. I had uh, I had the mountain man beard for a few months, and uh, the cops I were starting to look I at me funny. I can't talk about this. <laughs> you're starting to be no. profiled. <laughs> it's a little bit. With the the hoodie and the Ray Bans, I I looked like a a guy who used to hide in these parts in the woods. So that was kind of bad. <laughs> okay, let's run through the let's run through the hackers one more time. Amy, anything? This is it. 
This your shot. Nothing. I got no, nothing. You got nothing. Oh, I'm, they're dying Easter eggs right now. I'm already feeling like a horrible mother, okay? Oh, I'm getting off this and I'm going to read some Sandberg because I can't take it, the guilt. Okay, that's all I got this week. <laughs> Amy or Angela, are you, are, you, are you packing or you just got the dog taking care of you? <laughs> I'm always packing, oh, but the God. dog's taking care of me. <laughs> Can I just point out that the dog has way more hair than Sean? <laughs> and look how cute. <laughs> Brandy. Oh, Sean, I love you, Sean. I, I got nothing. I'm not even going to mock McGinnis on about his hair because I was he was the one I called when I said, hey, I need to shave my head. How do I Looking make for it tips shiny? and tricks. Yeah, tips how and tricks. How do I make it shiny? Tips and tricks. We got that. Oh, I, I like the sport and the hoodie thing. Now, this is nice. I can actually John see. John Ghetto. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Yuri. Passing to Margie. He's passing Skip to Margie. Skip to Margie. Holy cow, we got two hoodies going. Okay. Man, I'm sporting my button down. Well, you can have three. I have hoodie. I'm wearing no, it. <laughs> skip to, skip Brian, to Margie. Brian, you always have the same <laughs> outfit on, Brian. <laughs> what? Where you always have the same uniform. And can you boost your chair up a little? <laughs> my chair, if I boost my chair up, you can't see the top of my head. Just, what, do you well, want to look at his crotch? What, what is that all about? <laughs> yes, well, well, you guys check out Brandy's boobs. I would like to check there out Brandy's crotch. I've been thinking nice. about it for days. <laughs> Sheepers. <laughs> Next time you guys have me on the show, I'll come topless. <laughs> This is really why I come. I come for the start. I am not okay. topless. Stacy, for some reason, I want you to stand well, I will up, Randy. Stacy, can you take questions or something like that? Look at that. Then stand up. We have Stacy the Hobbit. No, okay, Stacy. Don. <laughs> What just happened to this hangout? I don't know. I showed up apparently. Olivia, this was my entire hangout was like this. There was yeah. no sense. I made, I made, I tried to make one serious statement. I said no one at our company has an ego, and that was it. It all went to hell. That was I'm the bringing the time. This is a myth that you keep propagating. You're the one that brought up goats and sheep. It's okay? recorded. It is not. <laughs> I'll be right there, honey. <laughs> okay, Margie, you want to wrap up this, girl? How do I wrap this up? L look what you've done. <laughs> I have nothing. Well, Margie, you've like this, this whole week. All yours. Here you go. This whole week, you kept like putting stuff on Facebook. Like I'm going to ask him this, and I'm going to ask him that. Well, yeah, but okay. So I was going to bring up your your social media 1918 post because I was going to guilt trip birthday boy Vadavinsky because he said when he was on. That that had inspired him to write a book, but he's not here. All of oh, my well, plans it. have fallen. Okay, so we'll we'll, we'll come back to it next time. Yeah. Hell, that post inspired me to write a book. <laughs> Your mom inspired me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> wow. She does that. Where's the Stacy Hood I know? Mama. <laughs> yes. She'll be glad to hear it. Oh, oh my god. god! Oh god! I'll be sure to tell her tomorrow. Okay, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> And the podcast. And social media truly is just like high school. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna end the broadcast. Stay online a little bit. I've got because uh, it's okay. funny. I just I don't know if Jason got the original invite. I just invited him separate, just in case he wants to join the after uh, party. I'm sure he wants uh, to hang with us instead of his wife on his birthday. Oh, I forgot about that. That's right. I just wished him a happy birthday. So. All right. So, into the broadcast. This is Sector's Hangout Chaos. Thanks for, really, hey, for coming on and managing to cover both uh, uh, social media and uh, zombies and why uh, Walking Dead has bad writing because zombies just aren't consistent at the threat level. Uh, so tune in for a special edition one that we've got noon tomorrow Eastern time with Stan yes. Phelps talking about what's your green goldfish. So talk to you later.